Amen, amen, amen. Thank you to Dave and to Savannah and for Kelly for leading us in worship. Y'all don't realize this, but next week, in addition to the sleigh bells and the drums, Savannah's going to have the knee cymbals and the harmonica for the full Dick Van Dyke, Mary Poppins experience. Thank you. Thank you to Allie on the ones and twos in the back. Thank you to Karma for being the den mother upstairs in room 350, the gathering cafe all the time. Thanks for our greeters, our coffee brewers, our people who set stuff out in the chairs, all the volunteers who make the gathering happen every week, people who are teaching and youth children, all of you. Thank you so much for all that you do. I can't tell you what an impact it makes. On Mother's Day, I want to share just a brief story uh, about my parents, and uh, I have a really great relationship with my parents, and it's always been pretty smooth. We did hit a little bit of a rough patch, Uh, in the late teenage high school years, um, the root issue for all of our conflict was my parents didn't realize that at age 14, I was a fully cooked adult who no longer needed any parenting. That was a failure of theirs to recognize how fully cooked I was. And so that's okay. And um, there's a story I actually remember uh, that I wanted to share with you this morning. It is a story. I wish it was a story that happened with my mom. It would have been perfect. It's actually my dad. Um, but I was in college in Austin. For those I, I've shared before, my parents dropped me off at the University of Texas in Austin and moved to Colorado the next day. They never even turned the Suburban back off the road. I didn't move far enough away, so they made up the rest of the distance. And so it was my third year of college, and I was um, living. I was in Austin, and I had my own apartment, and I was you know taking a full load of classes, and I was working part time. And my dad had some business that was bringing him into Austin for work. And so what he would do is he would, you know, those days that he was there, he'd make sure there was a free evening and he would come pick me up and we would go to dinner, right? Really loved it. And I really looked forward to it. And there was this one day where that was going to happen. And I was driving home from work uh, to go run to my apartment uh, to get, you know, ready and to get picked up by him and go to dinner. And I remember on my way there, dreading our interaction at the door because um, you know, it had been a really busy week, and a, I can't remember what was going on in that season, but I knew my apartment was not up to dad level clean. You know, everyone knows what dad level clean is. That's like Scandinavian art museum clean, <laughs> level clean. That's what I thought at the time. What he probably really wanted was like absence of food in it. <laughs> like, that's, that was the high school conversation we had over and over and over again. One of the sources of conflict was my parents didn't realize that me, a fully cooked adult, should be free to leave whatever pizza contents he wants to in his room for as long as he likes. And so I remember just dreading this interaction because we're, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing my dad. I love seeing my dad and he's in town, but he's going to stand there and he's going to open the door and he's going to see my apartment and it looks like a 20-year-old man lives there by himself, uh, which is exactly the case. And, uh, and then it's going to be a whole thing and he's, he's paying for that apartment and I'm not even keeping, blah, I'm just can't, I'm not looking forward to this, right? And so we get there and I show up and five minutes later, he's there at the agreed upon time and he opens the door and I'm ready for it. I'm ready just to hear the lecture, right? And he doesn't. I've shared this story before. He, I didn't get the lecture. Instead, you know, I was like, look, I'm sorry. It's a mess. I know. I can do better. I will do better. It's been busy. And he didn't give me the lecture. Instead, what he did, he's like, man, you're doing great with your grades. You're doing great at work. Like, I'm proud of you. That was it. And then we went to dinner, right? He's standing there in the midst of the dirty apartment that he's paying for, right? And we've, we've, we've done the rodeo on your place is dirty for years and years and years and years, right? And it still is. And he's standing there and he has every right to give me the riot act, man. Like, look at this. Like, take care, but do better. He doesn't give me that, right? I'm fully ready for it. Instead, what he does is build me up. Man, you're doing great in school. You're doing great at work. And we load up and we go to dinner. And the reason I share that story is I still remember that, right? It's 15 years later, I still remember that. And that moment in my life, that moment, that what he said and what he didn't say feels like the moment to me where we transitioned from a boy and his dad to a man and his dad, right? It set the very foundation for the relationship we have now, which is so good and so important and so meaningful to me, right? This, that, that very conversation, what was said and what didn't said was so powerful that he would come and he, would, he wouldn't have treated a friend of his like that. He wouldn't have treated someone he loved and cared about. He had transitioned to this whole new point of our relationship with his words. And I still look back on that positively today. And I think about it as I'm in the middle of fussing at my son for his room not being cleaned enough because I'm not perfect, right? But I wanted to share that story because it talks a little bit about the power of words. And that's what we've been reflecting on over the course of these last couple of weeks. We've been in a sermon series called Me and My Big Mouth. And Me and My Big Mouth, just a reminder, the name of this sermon series is not my spouse and their big mouth, right? The name of this sermon series is not my teenager and their big mouth, 
right? The name of this sermon series is Me and My Big Mouth. And rooted in this entire sermon series is the understanding that if we're going to be Christian people, if we're going to say Jesus is Lord in my life, if we're going to say uh, that, that this influences who I am and what I'm all about, our Christian faith does not stop at just influencing our beliefs. It does not stop at just influencing our feelings, but it continues on and influences and changes and shapes and molds our interactions with other people, right? Meaning there need to be multiple occasions in our life over and over and over again that our interactions with our spouse are different because we are Christians. Our interactions with the people who work for us are different because we are Christians. Our interactions with the people who are difficult to us, who are hard to interact with, that we observe on the television, that we speak to via email or online comments or on Facebook or anything. These things become different because we are Christians. So that's what we're focusing on over the course of this sermon series. Uh, we talked a couple weeks ago uh, about shaping the idea that we get this instruction from James on how we are to speak. James is pastoring a new church Right? A very early, very early portion of the Christian family story. There's a few decades after the death and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And James, Jesus' brother, is leading the gathering of early Christians in Jerusalem. And he's giving them directions on how to interact with each other, how to treat each other, how to be with each other. You need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. We reflected on that two weeks ago and last week. If you're going to be a Christian person, if you're going to let Jesus' way be your way in the world, one of the habits we need to adopt, particularly when we're on the verge of getting into an argument with someone, is putting ourselves in the posture of being first quick to listen, meaning asking questions, better understanding what's going on, because when someone is irritating us or perturbing us, perturbing, <laughs> Is that even the right use of the word? I don't know. Grammarians out there, holler at me. Don't. Um, when, someone's, when someone's irritating us or being difficult, whatever they're doing makes perfect sense to them. I'm not saying it's right, but it makes sense to them and doesn't make sense to us, which means we need to better understand, which means we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak because just launching back into them doesn't help us actually have a relationship or a conversation. And finally, we need to be slow to grow angry. Not for the purposes of winning, but for the purposes of having God's righteousness come out in and through us and into our relationships. It's been a whole lot of fun to get feedback from y'all over the course of this sermon series. One of the things I cannot emphasize strongly enough is do not send a sermon from this series to someone and say, I think you need to hear this. <laughs> One of you last week gave me the story that said, I waited four whole days before I did it. <laughs> And I said, how did that go? And they said, not great. <laughs> this is me and my big mouth, not them and their big mouth. I've also enjoyed you letting me know for all the people for whom this is wonderful advice, but it just doesn't work. Thank you for letting me know that this is not applicable to children under the age of five or over the age of 15. I appreciate your feedback. I don't think that's right, but I, I appreciate you giving it a shot. Let's keep at it. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to grow angry. Last week we talked about Another portion from James and this image that he gave us that our tongues are untamed, right? Things will just come out of them and we don't even mean to come out of them. And they'll light fires, right? These little sparks from our tongues will just light fires that burn and burn and burn and grow and grow and spread in our relationships and in other people's lives. You got to watch out for these fire starting tongues, James says to us. And we reflected on the idea that very few of us in this room and very people that we interact with in the world are going to be overtly fire starters, are going to intentionally trying to hurt or burn other people. Very few of us in this room are going to intentionally do those things. And yet, over and over again, sparks will come flying out of our mouths in negativity and in making jokes at others' expense and in sarcasm. Over and over and over again, without meaning to, sparks will go flying out of our mouths and our negativity, making jokes at other expenses and in sarcasm. We will start these huge fires. I got a story from one of our families. I was visiting with them, one of our youth families, and uh, they were talking about the message on the way home, which is wonderful, uh, the parents and the youth, and they were having a talk about that, the message and its application in their lives. And then on the way home, they started trying to figure out 
how to, where they're going to go to eat and where they're going to get lunch and what the time frame is for the rest of the day. And all of a sudden, all the lessons went out the window and all the conflict got back before someone who was holding the, holding the steering wheel turned around to everyone and said, y'all all need to shut your fire holes. <laughs> <laughs> A week, that's been making me laugh. Shut your fire holes. Sometimes we just need to shut our fire holes, you know? And when we find ourselves in our fire holes, been... <laughs> when we've been setting fires with our tongues, what do we do? We need to remember that this is a regular part of our lives. We need to surrender. God, use this part of my life to be for the good bets of other people and confess, y'all. I didn't, I didn't make it through. Last night, last night I messed up. Last night, I set off a spark in my house with the people I love more than anybody else in the entire world. And last night, I had to go around to my wife and say, I'm sorry about that. And I had to go to my son who witnessed, I'm, I'm sorry about that. And then I had to go through the whole rigmarole. I asked my son, uh, I, I, had, I had messed up. I had gotten in a fussing argument and that wasn't the right thing to do. And so I told my son, I'm sorry you saw that. And then he didn't see the makeup process. So I needed to tell him that we had made up and uh, I'm sorry that that happened and I made a mistake and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, how did it make you feel? And he's like, well, I wanted to say something, but I didn't. And I was like, well, what did you want to say? And he's like, well, I can't tell you because it's a bad word. <laughs> but I can spell it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, okay, what did you want to say? And he said, I wanted to tell you guys, S-H-U-T-U-P. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'm doing great, as you can tell. So that's what we're focusing on. But these have all been a little abstract, right? Uh, these, have all, these have all been a little abstract. So I want us to do an exercise this week. I want you to think about a person in your life for whom living this way is very difficult, right? I want you to visualize a person in your life for whom this is hard to apply, for whom speaking in this way is very difficult. I want you to think about a person for whom you have a bunch of zingers just lined up, like cocked and ready to go, right? If you're, now, I want you to do an exercise here. If you're a right-handed person, I want to take your, take your right index finger. If you're a left-handed person, take your left index finger. So take your finger uh, of your writing hand, take your flat palm of your other hand, and I want you to write that person's name in your hand. Write that person's name in your hand. For some of you, that's an arrow, left or right. <laughs> it's just something different when we see it. I'm writing mine. Oswald Falula McGillicuddy. I want you to think about that person, right? This person for whom quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to grow angry is just not working. I want you to think about this person for whom you're not worried about stopping the sparks because your greatest desire is to burn them down, right? I want to think about the person for whom you desire nothing more to get them in front of a whole group of people and just zinger, zinger, hadouken, right? Like you just got them. That was something special for everyone in their 30s. So I want you to think about this person, right? Because we have a piece of scripture today. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. It's going to be in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be in verses 29 through 32. Paul is writing to an early church that has conflict in it. And he's talking to these people, you're Christians now. They used to not be Christians, they're Christians now. They weren't born, they weren't grown up in the church. They didn't sing Jesus loves me as little kids. They don't know this little light of mine. They don't know how to do any of that. They used to be pagans. They used to live in this totally different way of seeing themselves and seeing the world. And now they are Christians and life is different. So he is teaching them how to live differently, particularly in the midst of their conflict. In the midst of their conflict, in the midst of their difficulty, Paul is teaching them how to be. And one of the things that he needs them to understand is that it's going to influence the way that they speak together. And so Paul, 2,000 years ago, knowing what the people then are going to face, just like people now, knowing the conflict, he's going to teach us how to just land them with zingers, right? He's going to teach us how to just flame them. He's going to teach us how to just burn them down and win the argument. And we're not only going to be right, but they're going to know that we're right. And they're going to bow down with crocodile tears and tell us just how right we are. Here these words. Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Oh, dang. <laughs> Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth, Paul says. In the midst of these conflicts, in the midst of these difficulties, 
in the midst of these arguments, you Christian people, looking at that person whose hand is written in your palm, knowing how difficult they are, knowing how hard they are, knowing how much they deserve it, Paul says, don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Only say what is helpful when it is needed for building up the community so that it benefits those who hear what you say. Don't make the Holy Spirit of God unhappy. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Put aside all bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, and slander, along with every other evil. Be kind, compassionate, and forgiving to each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Paul's talking to a church in conflict, and he has every chance to tell us how to win. He has every chance to tell us how to shame people, how to call them out, how to be victorious, how to be right, how to just flame them. And instead, he gives us this. The greatest purpose we have is not in winning or being right. Over the course of the last three weeks, we focused first on in the midst of that conflict, in the midst of that difficulty, in the midst of that desire to just get into it with somebody. The first thing we need to do is to stop and to listen because there is no future of peace between the two of you or the 10 of you or the million of you unless you care enough and work hard enough and try hard enough to actually at least understand the person and where they're coming from. Last week, we realized that when we engage, these words that we speak have the ability to spread and influence not only this relationship, but people's understandings of themselves, or understanding of God, our entire community, that these words are so incredibly powerful. And then this week, what Paul reminds us is you, the Christians, you, the people who are living differently, you, the ones who have set aside these old ways and adopted these new ways of Jesus, there is a way to do it right, and this is it. I want us to walk through, this is something we don't normally do, but I want to walk through this verse by verse. It's just four verses, and I want us to have a better understanding of all these different things. Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth, Paul says. Paul and James both have this image right? That feels so true to me today. I don't know if it feels true to you, but sometimes it feels like words just kind of come out, like they went from like your brainstem to your mouth, like they didn't engage the higher parts of your mouth. They just kind of snuck out before you even meant it. That's certainly what happened with me the other night, right? You just, y'all should go to the tent in the sanctuary service. <laughs> They're already out. That was your mistake. Um, <laughs> we got 45 more minutes. We're going to pass the basket again. Don't, no, it's the 9.30 service. So don't let any foul words come out of your mouth, right? This, 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 this recognition that we have to be on the watch, right? You have to be actively catching yourself because that's what happens, right? You don't sit there and stew on it. You have to be catching yourself for those words that are come out of your mouth. Paul didn't write, I feel like they're getting louder just to taunt me. <laughs> Paul didn't write the word foul. If you have another translation of the Bible, it says unwholesome. He didn't, um, he didn't write the word unwholesome either. He wrote the word in Greek, sapros, sapros. Right? The word sapros in Greek has a connotation or meaning. Sapros is the word uh, that you use to describe fruit that's just fallen to the ground and is rotting. Sapros is the word that you use to describe smelly fish. If fish is smelly, it's sapros. Don't let any smelly fish words come out of your mouth, Paul says. Only say what is helpful when it is needed for building up the community so that it benefits those who hear what you say. Say what it is that benefits or helps or builds up or encourages other people. For those of you who read the book, that's called Anatomy of Peace. It's an incredible book that talks about people who live in the heart of conflict. And one of the things that it points out is that you will never resolve the conflict that you have with another person. And it can be tough conflicts, right? It can be, it can be incredibly intransible and uh, intractable conflicts that you have, people who see the world differently than you, then think differently than you, that view the world differently politically or economically or socially or culturally or morally. It could be your own family. It could be someone distant. It will never change until the majority of your talking between you is focused on helping good things go right rather than just addressing the things that are going wrong. 
It's this incredible book, this modern secular scholarship that shows us those relationships will never change unless the majority of our talking together is on what is helpful when it is needed for building ourselves and others up so that it benefits those who hear what our say rather than directly addressing the thing that's going wrong. This amazing intersection of ancient and modern wisdom. That's what we're supposed to be doing with our words, Paul says. And then he says, don't make the Holy Spirit of God unhappy. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. You're Christians. He's telling them, you, these earlier people, don't you understand the living God is with you and in you now? This is not just a system of belief. This is not just something that you assent to, to go to the good place when you die. This is an active way of understanding yourself and others and everyone else in the world and the living God with you. Don't blaspheme that. Don't step out against that. Live in the midst of that. He says, you were sealed by him, meaning marked by him and given a quality assurance statement by him for the day of redemption, meaning you know where all this is headed. You know what really matters. Ultimately, you know how this story ends. Don't get dragged down by yet another petty argument, yet another little thing. Live in the grace and the glory of God and remember where all this is going and what really matters. He says, put aside all bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, and slander, along with every other evil. Yesterday, when my mouth shot off and I didn't even realize it, right? Just bitterness or something got a hold of me. You can't be bitter and be a builder at the same time. You can't be bitter and be a builder of other people at the same time. What's going on in your life? What's the thing behind the thing that is making you upset when you see a teenager whose room is dirty, right? They're a teenager. Their room will be dirty, right? What's the thing behind the thing that when all of a sudden something happens between you and your spouse, you immediately go nuclear? What's the thing, right? What's the thing behind the thing that when something goes difficult at work, you immediately freak out? What's going on? Put this aside, right? The losing your temper, the anger, the shouting, the slander, right? It's not we try to say nice things, and then if it doesn't work, we turn into a thermonuclear bomb, right? Put that aside. This building up, this Christian language, this living how God would have you live, put that other stuff away. And then finally, be kind, compassionate, and forgiving to each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. The person who's making you so upset What is it that's making them upset? Their ungratefulness? The person who's making you upset, what is it that's making you upset? Their inconsideration? The person who's making you upset, what is it that's making you upset? Their thoughtlessness? And yet you, who were thoughtless and inconsiderate and sinful and wrong and self-absorbed, and dramatic, and crazy, and everything else that's making you so mad in the lives of other people, you are all of that and more, and God sees you and says, you are good enough for me. What is it that's making you so upset with these people? What is it that's making you so frustrated? What is it that feels so wrong about what they're saying or doing or how they're acting? And remember that every little bit of that and more is in each and every one of us. And God looks at each and every one of us in the midst of that and says, you are forgiven. Look at your hand and the name that's visible there to you. Look at that real person, that real conflict, that real division, that real obstacle in your life. And hear these words. In the midst of all of that, Paul says to you, be kind, compassionate, and forgiving to that person. Be kind, compassionate, and forgiving to them in the same way that God forgave you in Christ. Then God says, talking to that person, Put aside all the bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, slander, along with every other kind of evil. That's not going to get you anywhere. And you know that because you've tried it your whole life and it never works. Them, this will be different. Put all of that aside. Then Paul says, don't make the Holy Spirit of God unhappy. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Remember who you are and whose you are, right? Remember how this all ultimately ends, this conflict, this difficulty, Remember how small this is in comparison 
to all the amazing, beautiful, amazing, good things in your life and in this world, all made possible through God and your Christ. Don't let this bring everything down. Only say what is helpful when it's needed for building up the community so that it benefits this person who hears you say it. Only say what is helpful to them, this person, this real person. Let the vast majority of your conversations with them be focused on helping what is going right, not constantly bringing up that little bit that's going wrong. Do not let any smelly fish words come out of your mouth. This is the lesson that scripture has for us today. Each and every one of us has a conflict. Guess what? In six months, all of us are going to have a conflict. Guess what? In 10 years, each and every one of us is going to have a conflict. The Christian life is about, not about living in the absence of conflict. And it's also not about winning and being right. The purpose of this is the transformation of everything into how God would have it be through what we say and through what we don't say. When my dad stood in the threshold of my dirty apartment 15 years ago, what he said and what he didn't say transformed our relationship into something stronger than it has ever been. This person, this person, if you live this way and talk this way to them, I don't know who's going to come out right. I don't know who's going to come out on top but what I do know is that your relationship will be transformed. And when you do it over and over and over again, and we all do it together, this world will finally be as God would have it be. Please pray with me. Great and loving God, these words of scripture challenge us, confront us, open our eyes to how easily it is that we fight, we slander, we let our bitterness hurt ourselves and hurt others. And we hear over and over again your words, God, reminding us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to grow angry, to watch the sparks that our tongues set loose, to not let foul words come out of our mouth, and God, to follow the platinum rule, not just treating others how we would have them treat us, but treating others how God treats us with forgiveness, compassion, grace, and mercy. God, let the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths be pleasing to you now and always. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, that we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.